Hello. 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 Ah. So we're going to actually readjust this. Perfect. So good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Sophia Nahlawi, author event coordinator here at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Thank you all for joining us for this evening's Writers Live program with Rabia Chowdhury, joined in conversation with Marsha Chatlin. First, some housekeeping. Tonight's format will be a discussion for 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A for the last 15 minutes, and then a book signing right outside the Wheeler Auditorium for the last half hour. We have audience mics at the end of both aisles, so when you have a question, please go up to those audience mics and say your question into them. We have books for sale by Greedy Reads right outside. If you haven't already, we would love for you to purchase a copy to get signed after the program. And we also have free parking at the Franklin Street Garage for anybody joining us for any of our programs now and forever forward. If you haven't already gotten a voucher from myself or Cleve, please join, please chat with us after the end of the program and we'll give one to you. And then finally, we have programming for January and February all lined up. We have flyers right outside, so please pick one up, take one with you, join us. We would love to see you again in the new year. And so now, on to tonight's program. Rabia Chowdhury is an attorney and the public advocate for Adnan Saeed. She is the executive producer of the HBO documentary series, The Case Against Adnan Saeed, that is based on her book, Adnan's Story. She is also the co-producer and co-host of the podcasts Undisclosed, The 45th, and The Hidden Jinn. Tonight, she joins us to talk about her memoir, Fatty Fatty Boom Boom, a personal exploration through her relationship with food and her Pakistani family. Told through recipes, family stories, and fond memories, Rabia shares her relatable and powerful past to talk about body image. Publishers Weekly says, engrossing. Chaudhry refreshingly issues conventional narratives about weight loss as well as fat acceptance. Victory is sweet and savory in this ebullient tale of self-acceptance. Food, gender, this is an important and savory work. Joining Rabia in conversation this evening is Marsha Chatlin, author of of the Pulitzer Prize winning book franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. She Hi, everybody. <laughs> Good evening. Hi, Hi, Marcia. How are you? I'm great. I'm so happy uh, that you're moderating tonight. Thank well, you. It's so great to see you. I have the real fortune of an author about an incredible book. So I'm going to talk to her. Grab you a bit about the book, and then we'll open it up for questions and comments from the audience. But I want to start with something you told me in team. Oh, I remember nothing, but I remember I had my last summer. Summer, you know, point. anything could emerge, right? right. I think <laughs> you had said, um, you know, I'm thinking about a way of kind of opening up communities look like. And so when this book came out, I mm -hmm. thought the
um, I, it's interesting that like, the the reaction of people when they read certain parts of like like my mother said this or an uncle said this and they're just kind of horrified. I, I I was never really even horrified in the moment when these mm -hmm. things happen. Mostly, I think because. Um, I, I, I always felt like their intention was not malicious. Mm -hmm. I never felt any hatred in it. My family never said, you're ugly. My family mm -hmm. never said, um, you know, they, they did say nobody will marry you because you're heavy. But that was literally, they're like, we know our people. We know our community. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to save you from them. And frankly, they were right um, in terms of like, you know, how I would be kind of evaluated by like prospective proposals for marriage because that, that was just the system. And, you know, when I when I got to my first marriage, and a lot of those same kinds of you know critical things were said to me, they were said with hate and malice, mm -hmm. and that's when I felt it, and it felt like arrows, and it was meant to hurt, and it did hurt, and the self loathing began. So I didn't have I didn't carry self loathing from my family because I mean they never even deprived me of food. Well, this is that's I the mean, thing. This is the wonderful irony, especially yeah. with immigrant families. They critique you about your weight, but if you're not eating enough, yeah. or if you are not kind of enjoying. The most important part of culture, which is food, yeah. then it's a problem. And so, you know, some of the messages feel, you know, very mixed. I'm mm -hmm. sure growing up, how did you think um, immigrating to the United States also kind of helped you understand like ideas about weight and beauty from home and now in the U.S.? I mean, let me let me just say that you know, for my for my parent when my parents came to the United States, they were the first on both sides of their family to come here. They had kind of I mean, they love their families, but they kind of escaped these multi-generational immigrant families back home who would normally keep a track of every single thing they did, where they went. They were like kids in this American candy store. Mm -hmm. Complete freedom. Their lives can look like anything. Nobody can stop them from what they want to eat and like talk about the land of abundance, right? So for my parents and me, it was just like letting three kids loose in a candy store and no boundaries and you know and they're adults and they have money so they can like <laughs> eat and buy whatever they want um and never in their imagination could they have thought did they think that the greatest country in the world would feed its citizens food that wasn't good for them mm -hmm. they i mean i i remember hearing them say over and over growing up like food in this country is pure they, that was the word they use pure in, in urdu they said it's pure Food back home has, they would say milabat, which means it has mi it's mixed with stuff. Like even if you get milk, it'll have like water mixed in. It's not mm -hmm. pure. So American food is pure. They didn't know it was pure, uh, you know what I mean. It was pure crap, a lot of it that we were eating. <laughs> um, and also I think they just never made the connection between food and weight because they grew up eating whatever they wanted. Yeah. And it never had an impact. They never really experienced like, so even the idea of depriving me of food didn't make, you know what my mom thought made me heavy? She said, reading. <laughs> she said, <laughs> God is my witness. To this day, she's in her 70s. She's like, you've always had a weight problem because you just sit and read, you sit and read, you sit and read. And your little sister is always running around. My sister to this day does not read. Um, and she's like, you know, and she has always been slender. So maybe there's something to the theory. Um, <laughs> So my, that's what my parents thought. I just sat too much. It wasn't the food I was eating. And so they, they just, and they didn't have elders to advise them, you know, frankly. If my grandfather, who was a pretty wise man, like he chucked the, the baby formula my mom brought home from the hospital back in Pakistan when I was born, if he had seen the things we were eating and read the labels, he would have condemned it wholesale. <laughs> but like, you know, bologna and crackers and just, I mean, like that's like what, I'm still made up of in so many ways, it feels like. Well, throughout the book, I mean, also it's also very hard to read the book unless you're like on a full stomach because you just want to eat. I mean, there's so many beautiful descriptions of food. And I had I had gotten some not very good Indian takeout <laughs> while I was reading your book and it made me even sadder that it wasn't yeah, that Yeah, that's good. sad. Um, so Marsha has been initiated in, with Pakistani home cooking oh in my, my home. Oh my God, it's unbelievable. And yeah. Robbie will say, oh, I didn't do that much. And there'll be like 30 dishes no, here, and you're wondering how this all showed up. And you're, I said, Rabia, what did you make? She goes, oh, I only made like 20 of these 30 things. <laughs> no. The other 10 I ordered. But, you know, th this is like, it's such a beautiful and rich description of food. And one of the things I appreciate is, you know, the joy you talk about, you know, eating, um, eating samosa or palu, you talk about the same way like Oreos. Hmm. Like there is this real way that both kind of, foods even though their qualities might be different yeah. are about a kind of joy and enjoying consuming yeah and i'm curious about the kind of ways that um you know 
so much of what you write about in your time in Pakistan is about food and community, but also a certain kind of abundance mm -hmm. that isn't in the U.S., right? right. And there's, there's these differences. And so what are, you know, what were your kind of early memories of Pakistan and what was it like kind of missing home, but finding a new home in the U.S.? You know, I mean, being six months old when I came here, mm -hmm. it was it was like I didn't really have much to miss. It wasn't until I was a little bit older and visited a couple of times um, that you finally have like something to miss. But look, you know, I think a lot of immigrants um, and though like they end up romanticizing back home, mm -hmm. right? Like, and so I know a lot of my I don't even there must there's a the German word for everything. There's got to be a German word for longing for something you never knew type of thing, mm -hmm. right? Like that connection to. You guys know what the word is? No, there's a word though. <laughs> <laughs> I can guarantee there's a word for it, um, or a Japanese word or something. But yeah, so but for me, I mean, like the the interesting thing about like um, what, what comes up for me when you talk about like the descriptions of food. So my editor, the editor who bought this book at Algonquin, um, when I wrote the proposal, the proposal is pretty much exactly kind of how the book turned out, um, except for the fact that the book has 10 recipes. And in the proposal, I had said every chapter would end with a recipe mm -hmm. that corresponds. And and you have the ed this editor, uh, Amy Gash, she's fantastic. She bought the book. I write the book and I sub I had submitted maybe about half of it to her. And this is about a, a year, year, year and a half ago. I, I might be getting timelines mixed up. And uh, she's like, we need to get on a call. And I was like, all right, well, we get on a call. And just to set the scene, she had already told me um, she's like, you know, I'm not a foodie, I don't cook, and I've never had a weight problem. So I was like, why'd you buy this book? But <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> who are you? She's like, I am really confused. She's like, I don't understand what this book is. And I said, what do you mean? She's like, well, you're talking about like these really painful moments in your life, and then you talk about food in such a rich, joyous way. I'm like, what's, what's the disconnect? <laughs> she's like, it's like you're sending mixed, mixed signals. And I said, I'm not sending any signal to anybody. It's not a prescriptive book. I said, What's confusing for you as somebody who hasn't had a weight problem is the idea that somebody who has is allowed to enjoy food. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is, and I was like, that's precisely like, and my agent was also on the call with me. My agent has experienced like weight struggles and everything. And we got off the call. She's like, Robbie, it makes total sense to me. And um, it's, it's everybody, who doesn't love food? I mean, what I've kind of person does people who are like, I'm not that into eating. I'm like, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? <laughs> what do you live for? <laughs> what do you live for? And, I mean, and I think that the, the thing that's so sweet is you talk about as, you know, as a, as a youngster and as, as a teenager, the idea of food as like the place where you can be bad or your mm -hmm. escape. And I think that's a very kind of normal thing for especially the kids who are good yeah you were a good kid. like i said i didn't do premarital premarital sex or drugs i did like you know kfc and arby's absolutely um <laughs> on, on the down low like that's what i was back. and i mean one of the things that i also think is really illustrative for people who are coming to this with a uh, without a lot of context is that as a as a young muslim woman there is it's clear that there's a level of kind of modesty that is really valued mm -hmm. And there's a still a fixation on beauty in the body. Oh, sure. And that those aren't mutually exclusive. And I like the ways you talk about colorism mm -hmm. and body size. And, you know, you talk about when your auntie gets married and she's not supposed to be excited about getting married, but she has to be the most beautiful woman who's getting married. And so, you know, that kind of duality, I yeah. love how you say, like, here I am in the middle in my body with my skin tone. And this is how people yeah. are perceiving me. Yeah, the message is, um, and you know, maybe part of it's generational. I don't, I think, I mean, especially like for, like, I have a 25 year old, a 14 year old daughter, and obviously for them, their experience is going to be completely different. Mm -hmm. I, I, do, I think back home, though, it might not be so different for young girls even today, but the message is you might become an award winning doctor who cures cancer, but if you haven't gotten married, it's not even so much that it's your fa failure, it's the failure of the parents. Yeah. Like, this is a sacrosanct duty. And if we die without having wed our children, like we have failed the one thing that like we 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 can't even face God, like as we felt. So it's so important. So the idea like, you know, always like kind of, you know, making sure that every young girl is on that path. And and it's not even like boys can get away with it. Boys have to get married too, but their standards are different. For a boy, mm -hmm. you better have an education and a job. You can look like what you want, but for a girl, you gotta look cute. You gotta look, you have to be thin. If you're lucky, you're tall. You have to try to be fair skinned by using bleaching products and doing whatever you can. And if you aren't unfortunate enough to actually be brown skinned or dark skinned, good luck, you know, getting married. And it's really poignant when you talk about skin bleaching and the practice yeah. and the, the what is being sold 
to people. I, I was at a Pakistani store here in Maryland mm -hmm. just a couple weeks ago, and uh, there's a whole stack of Fair and Lovely. They're trying to rebrand it as Glow and Lovely. I'm like, it's the same <laughs> thing. Well, you know, but I used it. I yeah. used it for years. Yeah. It doesn't work. But also, you know, it's just a shame that like celebrities, you know, in South Asia still sell this stuff and they do the commercials. India, I will have to say, I got to give them some props. In Indian media, cinema, film, TV, you will see people of different skin shades. Mm -hmm. But in Pakistani media, whether it's fashion, film, whatever, TV, um, you, they are, they are so white. They're like whiter than white people. Like, mm -hmm. and that you have to, and if they want somebody to play a brown character, a brown skin character, because that is part of the character and part of that character struggles, they will use brown face yeah. on a fair skin person. Yeah. They and have you, a long way to go. One of the things that it's, it's also really clear about how you talk about, you know, the, the context of, about skin and body and size. And then, you know, when we think about bleaching creams don't work, you also talk about being in kind of structured diets mm -hmm. and the various diets that you're introduced to as a, you know, teenager growing up in the U.S. that in most of those diets that we can also identify. And most of my adulthood. And most of your adulthood. Most of our adulthood. Like I, I did, yeah, I went, yeah, I went for years without eating pasta and rice and oh, bread. Oh, remember those? We've all done no that. The no-carb years. They were terrible yeah, yeah. in America. Yeah. That's like the worst years. <laughs> Um, and, you know, you ate bread in front of people and they, you know, looked at you like, you know, you had lost your mind. But, you know, during those times, you're kind of moving through these like trends and fads. You know, what what mindset did you have about all of them? Like quick fix or I'll try this or I'm doing this to appease other people. Because I also know the feeling of like, OK, I'm on this because everyone says I should be on this, but I really don't want to be on this. Every single one of those eff efforts was an act of desperation. Yeah. An act of absolute desperation. Like maybe this will be the thing that fixes me. And every time it failed, it, was, it wasn't because this thing was designed to never be sustainable mm -hmm. and lasting and have, you know, um, and, and be something you can do for your life. But it always was like, this is my failure. I don't have the discipline. And, you know, and I got this message a lot from people around me, but also you get it constantly, like from magazines, like, you know, it's all about willpower. It's all about like calories in, calories out, which is such a lie, by the way. <laughs> but I didn't realize until like five years ago, that's a complete lie, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it always felt like I, I'm just desperately trying to get control. And mm -hmm. I don't know why I can't control my body. I, and on the outside, you know, my career is doing pretty well. I'm pretty, um, you know, I'm pretty confident. I do it well before cereal. I was doing public speaking and writing. And I'm like, I, I got, I can kind of take care of whatever I need. I've got gone through some hard times and I can keep, keep my shit together. But on this front, I just couldn't never, I, I was constantly failing. And so every time I try it, I was like, this is the fix, but anything that's a 30 day, 60 day, 90 day is never a fix. Um, and it would just be one disaster after another because you would lose a little weight and then you have to go back to being human right. and life happens and you're not going to eat, uh, you know, like a caveman for the rest of your life. Like that's an actual diet, the caveman diet, right? Like, I mean, everything, I've done everything. And one of the things that, you know, we were talking about is, so you're probably one of the most successful people <laughs> that I know personally, like you, not I mean, not. you have just done incredible things. Um, and at the same time, you know, I said, you could probably list every achievement and tell me what weight you were when that thing happened. And I said, I feel this, you know, I yeah. said, that's kind of how I understand my life. Yeah. I know what size I was wearing, what was, you know, what diet I was on. And so, you know, having kind of moved through the memory of your life, thinking about the context of your body and diets and fat, you know, what are some of the other ways that you start to reimagine your past or start to think about your past now that you've acknowledged how much this was part of it? Or can you? I mean, the, so, you know, I couldn't have written this book five, six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. It was really like about four years ago. I got to the point where I was like, I, I felt like I had finally figured it out. Mm -hmm. I had figured out um, all the lies, <laughs> what really works, and what, what actually um, I was trying to achieve. And it wasn't that I was trying to achieve a goal weight. Mm -hmm. I was trying to achieve control. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to understand, like, I wanted to understand my body. I, I felt like I had been in constant, like, just a constant odds, like this, I'm trapped inside this enemy that I cannot control. Mm -hmm. And so four years ago, I finally 
was like made friends with her. And I'm like, okay, I figured you out. And it's, it wasn't your fault. It's because I was given all this wrong information all these years. But so then when I started writing, I mean, I don't journal, but it was almost like a reverse journaling. And I started writing and I've never, nobody, <laughs> now everybody knows how much I weighed at every given point in my life. But up, up until I put it in down in this book, nobody did. So, you know, I, I had three children and I've delivered them in hospitals. And every time I'd go into labor, with, in two different marriages, two different husbands, all I would be thinking about as I'm having horrible labor pains is don't let my husband see the chart at the end of the bed because he'll see how much I weigh. Like I would be obsessed with the chart. You know, I'd be like trying to distract my husband from the chart because <laughs> I didn't want him to know that no. I weighed 200 and whatever pounds. Um, so when I started writing this down, I decided I had decided that I have to, I'm going to be like honest, but also I was like, I can't believe I remember all these things. I can't believe I remember. I probably have lost so many incredible memories, but I've hung on to this, you know, mm -hmm. of all things. And like you and I agree, Oprah probably remembers like every single how, what she weighed at every <laughs> single point in her life yeah. too. Um, this like, and by the time I was done writing it, I felt like um, I had really kind of solved this. You know, I mean, like my work is around solving mysteries, right? Like when you are trying to exonerate somebody who's innocent. What you're trying to do is figure out who actually killed a victim. So that's like, that's, you're solving a murder mystery. And I felt like I had finally solved my mystery. Like I had just figured it out. I had figured, I had connected so many dots. Um, I had figured out that in the moments where I felt most out of control and I was unhappiest with my body, I used to think in that moment that my circumstances are miserable because I'm miserable in my body but it was actually the other way around. Mm -hmm. It was when things were horrible around me. I was surrounded by the worst people in the most difficult circumstances that it manifested in my body. And so I was able to forgive myself, you know, a lot of these things. It has helped me rewrite the story of, of how I always, I just thought I was a constant like failure on this front. Well, one of the things that's so striking is that, you know, we also move from you being, you know, a kid, a teenager, a young wife and mom, and then you become a public figure. Yeah. And there's one thing to kind of struggle with your appearance and your body when it's your family judging you. I, you know, after Serial, a lot of people knew you. A lot of people knew what you looked like. And one of the things, again, you never see yourself the way other people see you. You're so gorgeous. So I think that was the other thing. You're like this, a stretch, but okay. this, no, like the super <laughs> striking, you know, lady lawyer who was going to, you know, free someone. I mean, that's what I like. The first time I saw your picture, I was like, oh, my God, this woman's so gorgeous. And she's doing this. And meanwhile, you're thinking, I'm getting my picture taken constantly. I'm on TV. And there's nothing kind of, um, I think, more jarring than thinking more people have access to a yeah. self that you feel. That must have been quite the experience. I spent my entire life dodging photographs. Oh and, um, and it really breaks my heart now when I look back, especially when I had my eldest. I was 22 when I had her. I have almost no pictures with her because mm -hmm. I would not get... Like, you know, I just, and in the meantime, my sister and my cousins, all my friends were like doing all these cute poses and everybody's like a, a Charlie's angel or whatever. <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't, no. I'll take the picture. I don't want to be in the picture. My high, my high school yearbook, I was, I had senior pictures, but I never appear like in any of the other year. I just wouldn't go to photo day. I wouldn't show up to get my picture taken. And so when serial happened and everybody wants a selfie with you, it was like torture. It was torture. And um, at the same time, I was like, my two choices are I let the momentum die out and I hide because I got to tell Adnan, I would have fought for you, but I look terrible in photographs. <laughs> um, Yo, good luck. <laughs> good luck. Um, you got to wait till I look great for me to like do it. Or I just got to ride this wave. And so yeah. I was like, I got to ride this wave. And so, my God, there's still a picture taken in the Baltimore Sun. They sent a photographer out. I was like, and, and I was also getting no sleep and I was traveling so much and I was like crazy. And this picture showed up, I think like this big in the, in the, in the newspaper. <laughs> and my mom like framed it. I'm like, it is the most hideous photograph. And so it was just picture after picture in which I felt like just, just absolutely hideous. But also people kept tagging me and saying, you know, and I'm like untag, you know, or and they want you to, they want you to like, I'm like, if I respond to this tweet, then I will have attracted all my fault. It was just like, but it was, and I, and I would constantly feel like this is so petty. I'm fighting for something big and important and noble. And I'm thinking about like how my stomach looks in this picture. Right. So I had to constantly keep talking myself down. But the truth is this, when you are a, a female who is a public figure, it is low hanging fruit um, to come after your looks and people do. 
People don't do that for men, but they do it for women. And I always had groups of people who were like people who were like a non guilters or hated me also for also known as trolls uh, trolls <laughs> mm -hmm. but um or maybe uh, the local prosecutor it could have been i don't know who it was online i'm not sure who it it's was it's a big umbrella it's a big it's tent. a big umbrella yeah and then there were other people who hated me for other reasons and they would create memes based they so my picture would be turned into a meme um with something terrible on it and then it's getting like thousands and thousands of likes and shares and one time i remember seeing one photograph that turned into a meme that was about how I looked in the photograph. And I there were a couple of people I knew and like I personally knew like that at one time we had been like friendly or at least friends. Like I had been in their home, they'd been in my who had liked that the oh, meme. No. So you know, you don't want to lose sleep over this, especially when you're like, I'm a lawyer, I'm an advocate, <laughs> I have more serious things. But there were nights when I cried about this mm -hmm. stuff. It hurts at the end of the day. Yeah. Um I'm lucky that you know, my husband, my current and hopefully final husband <laughs> <laughs> um, 17 years tomorrow. It's our oh, anniversary. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. That's very sweet. Um, there's never been a moment in our marriage, I don't care when I've been at my heaviest and also mm -hmm. my lowest, that he hasn't always said that you're beautiful and incredibly supportive and loving and just forget what's on the internet. But um, he's not the one being tagged, so it's hard. Well, what's interesting is throughout the book, men are also struggling with their appearance, but it doesn't have the same consequence. Right. So whether it's your grandfather, whether, you know, it's, my dad, um, your yeah. dad, you know, men are also kind of going through a parallel process, but it just never quite hits the same way. Yeah. And I'm sure throughout this whole, you know, journey of, of talking about this, how do you talk to your family before you write a memoir like this and um, your two daughters and your son? Like, yeah. what do you imagine for them could be different in the ways that they look at themselves and their body? So, you know, I, ha I did have to speak to my parents a little bit um, because I had to start the book from when they actually met. But it, these are stories that also I've heard a million times, but I was like, <laughs> let me just verify one last time before I put this down in the book. Um, having said that, I also knew, and this is absolute truth, nobody in my family reads, like nobody reads. No, it's for the best. It's really for the best. Do I, they watch CNN though? Do they watch CNN? No one will read my books, but if, if, if I'm from a culture in which people watch CNN yes, all family, day long. So yeah. that's how they like will see me. Yeah. If I my, my family will watch video snippets. Right. <laughs> they, nobody has read my book. And they never will. Um, and that means I can write whatever I want. Blessings upon blessings. Blessings upon <laughs> blessings, I got to say. Um, but the funny thing is my, I gave my mom an advanced copy, um, I don't know, six, seven, eight months ago. And she read like the first, I don't know, the first five or 10 pages. And those are, the first chapter is about my parents. <laughs> and so she put the book down and first she said, nobody's ever going to read this. I want you to know. Um, and then she said, uh, then she started calling it um, the book you wrote about me. <laughs> and ever since then, like as it's getting like all these starred reviews and Chelsea Clinton blurb, but she's like, that book you wrote about me is doing really well. <laughs> I was like, yeah, mom, I guess it kind of is about you. But uh, so, yeah, I didn't have to have a lot of conversations. And truth is, the stories I tell, I'm in those stories. And, you know, right. I could go back and say, hey, uncle, do you rem remember it this way? Or did you? At the end of the day, what matters is how I remember it. Mm -hmm. It's my story. They can write their own memoirs, which they never will because um, they, they don't read. So if you don't read, anyway, um, and then for my kids, I will say this, and I, I, and I had a revelation about this, again, as I wrote, I just learned so much just about me and how I operate and mm -hmm. all the dynamics between me and my family and then me and my children through the writing the book. So when I had my eldest, I was 22, and that's when I was in an abusive marriage, and I was in a really bad place, and I was eating like a child, and I was stressed, and I would eat in secret, but I, my diet was mostly fast food, convenience food, junk. And that's what I fed my daughter. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, who's now 25, still has that palate. And 10 years later, when I had my next child, uh, my daughter, I had discovered salads by my 30s, thankfully. <laughs> and so that daughter ate like I ate in my 30s. And by the time my elder one was about 10 or 12, and I'd say, eat fruits and vegetables, eat fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. thinking, what's wrong with her? She, you know, what, what's wrong with this kid not remembering I fed her nothing but nuggets and fries for the first four or five years of her life, right? Like, um, and so what I've realized is it's never been, it's never what you say to your kid. You are modeling behavior. Mm -hmm. So my eldest eats um, like I did during her formative years. My 14-year-old to this day, like, you know, gets up and has a bowl of granola and says, no, thank you to the fried eggs. Uh, she eats, and my, my, then I had a surprise baby in my 40s and he's built like a Mack truck. He's oh just God. a big boy. Yes, yes. Um, he's real solid and he's real tall and he 
eats a little bit of everything because that's how we eat now. We don't really restrict, we don't restrict our kids' foods, you know what I mean? And my eldest is obviously an adult, so she can eat as she wants. But I um, realized with a lot of shame that I programmed her. Mm -hmm. And then I'm after her all these years saying, why don't you eat better and take care of yourself? I programmed her like that, yeah. Because it's, it's not just about kind of like the messages you got about eat this, not that, but also about kind of where you would fit. Yeah. So ideas about marriage and being accepted yeah. and, yeah, you know, yeah, how, how do you tweak those messages for your kids? As you well? know, so for my eldest daughter, she, I mean, I'm so proud of her. She is doing her, uh, she has a full-time job. She's doing her master's at Georgetown. She bought a, her own home. I mean, like, what else could I ask for, right? Except my mother's like, but she's not married. Oh, man. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> grandma, every time she sees her yeah. grandmother, my, my mother's like, when are you getting married? When are you getting married? And I have said to my daughter, I mean, I, 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 what I've said to her, I think it's a happy medium. Mm -hmm. I said, if you want ever for me to be that kind of auntie mom who makes introductions and finds possible, like, I'm happy to do that. And if you don't, then do your thing, right? Let me know. Invite me to the wedding, like, if it happens. And there are also lots of people who decide they don't want to get married. They don't want to have kids. And I think that's a completely legitimate choice, too. Um, and that's not a conversation that I can have with my my parents, and they'll understand because they're going to think I'm ruining my children's lives <laughs> by telling them if they don't want to get married, they don't have to. Mm -hmm. But as far as I'm concerned, um, she is a success in and of itself. And if her and my 14-year-old is like, you know, is is she's like 14 going on 45 anyway. So, you know, she's like, she, they'll be fine, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to worry about it. Um, and that's, I'm, I mean, like I... I grew up in America. My my sensibilities around these issues are very different. And so before I open it up to the audience for questions and comments, I'm curious about, you know, this is the last of your kind of events for the launch. Yeah, you this hung is the in last there. official uh, event of the book tour. And, you know, <laughs> you've, you have, you're one of these people, you've had like 10,000 careers in one very short period of time, right? Yeah. You've been able to do kind of advocacy for the Muslim community. You um, helped exonerate someone mm -hmm. in a climate that is just impossible in so many ways. Um, you've done this kind of memoir. Your podcasting is fantastic. I think in a lot of ways you've created a new way of thinking about what we call true crime podcasts for you know Thank benefits you. of others. I mean, it's really amazing. I love you. Thank you. And so... <laughs> Marsha's been on my show, by the way. <laughs> I know. It's like, I'm a plant. But, you know, I was, I was talking, I don't know, I was talking to my husband about this event, and I was like, Rabia's just, like, so smart. <laughs> like, you just know how to do a lot of things, and if you don't know how to do it, you figure it out really fast. Because mm -hmm. you said, I don't know if I ever really listened to podcasts, but I figured out how to make one and really make an impact. And so when you think about kind of the next corner that you want to see around yeah. and your ability to use both your personal and your professional life, what story would you like to tell next? Oh, gosh. Um, I, I, let me just say one thing. A lot of these things, whether it was like a non-story, um, undisclosed, these were uh, a means to an end. These were tools of advocacy. So I was like, how do I keep his story alive? Like, literally, that was my only message. And a few years ago, when his conviction was reinstated, we lost the appeal here. I was like, am I going to have to write Adnan the musical next? Because I will... <laughs> Like I, will, <laughs> I will figure out how to write a musical. Like, I'll figure it out um, if I have to. Or I'm running for attorney general. It's one or the other. Like, which, which do I do? I remember we talked about We that. talked about that. I was like, there's got to be a political fix. I mean, I am that person if I'm I like, I'm a dog with a bone, right? I'm like, yeah. I'm not going to let go. But look, the last time I was in downtown Baltimore, it was to walk Adnan out of the, oh. the, the courthouse. Yeah, September 19th, the most amazing day of the year. Um, the story I want to tell next is probably, look, I'm going to be doing innocence work probably for the rest of my career. My heart, that's where my heart is. Um, even though we've wrapped up undisclosed, I'm working on other cases. I'm working with Colin. Right now, I was on a live. Well, I was Susan Simpson, who's my colleague in undisclosed. Um, she was live streaming from a, uh, a jailhouse in, in Georgia. And she to a case she's been working on, two people just got released tonight. I mean, and, like I watched Amazing. it before I walked in here tonight. Uh, two more exonerees, um, you know, innocent people. So I'm like, it's incredible work. So I'm working on three different cases right now. I'm always going to do that. But I love, I love to write and I love to tell stories. And I had started writing a book, a novel, before I started writing this. And I wrote about a third of it. And um, I'll probably go back and finish that. And it was based on 
an incident that happened when I was in my 20s. I was in Pakistan and I was abducted for a night. And it was harrowing. And it was the only time in my life I'm like, I'm definitely getting killed tonight. I was wondering if you were going to put it in here. I didn't put it in here because I it didn't kind of quite fit the theme. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but that story is like, you know, I just got to get it out. So I'm going to I'm gonna go back and finish that. And we've talked about other books. I want to write with you. I, I write know, so I know. So like, yeah, yeah. There's, there's you just a, have 900 times more energy than I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just always feel like I'm running out of time. There's too much I want to do. Yeah, I'm almost well, 50 folks. We are, yeah. we are grateful for all that you have done thus far, and we can't wait to see what's next. Please join me in thanking Ravia for this conversation. And so if you are able and have um, a question, uh, would you like to, do you run the mic like Donahue? This is when I age myself. Half of you won't be old enough to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> or do you go? <laughs> so if anyone in our audience has a question, you, I invite you to come up to this mic where I'm at or this other mic where I'm at ask your questions so that our online audience can hear it as well mm. um and yeah we have around 20 minutes so get your questions out now all right a brave soul the first one I always, always tough, the and then like it opens <laughs> it up yeah. thank you for uh, your discussion my question relates to um, your perception of the impact of colorism on self-esteem among those people who have who believe that they have to be somebody other than who they are. Yeah. Um, this is a legacy of um, being colonized. You know, there's no. There's no group of people that was colonized that was not left with that legacy of self um, hatred and hating their skin color because they were made to feel inferior because of their skin color. And that just has lingered for, you know, what, 70 years in, in, in my country at least. Uh, and I don't know how long it's gonna stay there. I mean, like, it has a profound impact. And my, my aunt, uh, at one point tried to like just scrub the brown mm -hmm. off of me with this implement. It's made out of a brick, scrub and scrub and scrub because she's like, it's just dirt. I'm like, what about DNA? Like, you know, <laughs> my dad is like mahogany. Like, what about DNA? Um, but there, it's, <clears throat> I, I just, I don't know. I, I, the only, the only, um, yeah, I'll say this. I am, I am happy though. I feel like we're living in a time when you finally do see some incredible representation of all kinds of body sh uh, shapes, every kind of skin tone in media, magazines, I mean, you know, music everywhere. Um, but again, that's not in every part of the world. It's like mostly like mm -hmm. in the West, we're, you're seeing a lot more of it. But that's what it's going to take for people to finally accept everybody who is human to be human. And it's, I mean, but it, it is, I mean, I come from a society that is deeply racist, frankly. I mean, there's a lot of racism, like in, in, in South Asian societies. There's a lot of racism in the Arab world. There's a lot of racism. I mean, every, I feel like every society kind of has its own like unique um, brand of racism. And, and that's, you know, it is a struggle. So I don't know. I mean, but as far as self-esteem, I mean, it took me, I don't want to say this. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to out her, but I, I have a relative who is probably the same skin shade as mine. And she only wears foundation that's like five shades it's, too light for her. It's, she, yeah. always, she always looks like yeah. a ghost. I mean, yeah. like it's, and I want to say, you got to like, and, but she knows it, but she's like, I do it on purpose. I don't want to look my skin color. And when, and for a while, when I was younger, I would do that too, because that's actually what they do back home. That's what they do back home. When you go to beauty parlor, they first bleach your skin, and then they put on like geisha type, mm -hmm. very, very like stark white foundation. So when I started wearing foundation that actually matched my skin color, there were people close to me who were like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're not gonna show up in pictures. And I was like, I kind of like the brownness, you know? Like I kind of like the brown, but I wasn't until I was like in my early thirties that I was like, I could wash my face and be completely brown and 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 be okay with it. Took a long time. Yeah. This is yeah. This might be a better because it's hard yeah, to like see. <laughs> Hi, 
Well, I'm used to the struggle. Yeah. So, um, but thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about your writing practice because you are, as we heard, such a busy person. You have several podcasts. Uh, you are a practicing attorney. So, how do you find time for writing, and what does it look like? Like, are you just writing on your way somewhere, or do you actually sit down and do this? Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. And um, you know, the truth is, like, ninety percent of my work is writing. You know, podcast. My podcast scripts. Between the amount of scripting I do, that's probably like three books a year. I mean, like it's like every episode is like ten thousand words. It's a lot, and I. But I like to write. But I. My process is this: first, before I put anything on paper, I have written it in my head. So I'll spend whatever time I need to say, okay, in this essay or this chapter or the next ten page or whatever. Like this is what I need to convey. Um, but writing is a discipline. Like I, I treat it like a job. So when I'm like, I wrote a non-story in six months. And I wrote eight hundred pages. Because every day from seven to ten, I wrote. I don't care if it was good, bad, or whatever. And then from ten to the rest of the day, I did my actual full-time job. Um, and when I wrote this book, it was the same thing. I have working hours. I don't care if the muse hits me or not. I don't care if I'm inspired. It's a job. You got to sit down. I got to bang out. Like from this time to this time, I'm writing. And um, there are times when I work great on a deadline. So if there's a deadline, I will get it done. But when there's not a deadline, what has really worked for me is writing sprints. Like if I just want to, so the interesting, like the, the novel that I talked about writing, when you, when you um, for folks who might not be familiar with publishing, if you want to write a nonfiction book, you don't have to sell the whole book. You just have to sell a proposal. So you can write your proposal at 25, 30 pages. You sell it. Now you're like, oh, no, I got to write the book. But with a fiction book, you have to write the whole book, which means there's no real deadline. You just got to write it when you write it, and then you go out and start trying to sell it. So when I was writing that, I, because I didn't have the deadline, and I, I wasn't as, you know, like, motivated, I would do sprints. And they actually work really well. So a writing sprint would be like just one solid hour of turn everything off, focus writing. And you can bang out like maybe like, you know, 500, 600 words. Um, and if you could do that consistently, you will have a book in a couple of months, you know? So writing sprints work really great, actually. Thank you. Yeah. And one, one of the things I want to She's a writer, too. Like What's your writing part? I mean, yeah. it's just all chaos. But um, when people interview me about writing, I say that undisclosed was one of the greatest things for my writing. Really? Because uh, when I worked on Undisclosed um, for those 16 weeks, we did 16 episodes. I don't think people realize when podcasters have a good podcast, they've essentially written like a novel every week. And every week. you and Susan and Colin with Undisclosed, the quality of the writing oh. and the volume of the writing and the time that it took to turn around, it transformed my ability to just really focus yeah. and tell a story. I mean, I don't think people really get podcasting yeah. that is like the serious stuff that you guys do, yeah. just what... A production it is. Yeah, no, we've we've had scripts where uh, usually when Susan wrote them, it'd be eighteen thousand <laughs> words long, and I was like, this episode is going to be two and a half hours long. But she's like, we need it. We need all this information about this case. And Context, it was a, definitions. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. it's really amazing. We will listen as an avid podcast listener. We are listening. Um, I'm just adding up in my head all of the money I have spent going to tanning salons over my life trying right. to be brown. And, right. Uh, right. But no, my question, I'm an English professor and I'm thinking just about your writing and about memoir. Um, one thing that we're always teaching our students um, with research, we're always thinking about just valuing research so much. But in the last few years, I feel like we have started to really try to get students to see the personal side of stories as well and to get them, you know, it's almost like they've gone, you know, we, we've gone too far to research and not enough to the personal narrative. And I was just wondering, um, you know, what you would say to young writers as far as the value of, of including something like your memoir, your connection to a story in addition to research. I, I mean, I think it's... The I don't just think it's the most important thing that a writer can do. I think it's the most important thing human beings can do, frankly. You know, I spent six years working in national security policy, and the focus of my work was trying to figure out how does ideological extremism, like, take hold? How do entire groups of people decide they hate other groups of people? And, um, and how do you reverse that once it's taken root? And it was like, you know, there's all these studies, and, and at the end of the day, they're like, it's not data, it's not facts. Facts don't matter. It's always storytelling or a personal connection. And so the power of storytelling, and I mean, like, you know, whether it's scripture, whether it's Shakespeare, I mean, storytelling is so powerful. And what I realized, so what Serial taught me 
was that, you know, the, you know, when when Serial came out, I was like, I was a little bit ner I was really nervous because I thought in post 9-11 America, where I have spent years trying to humanize American Muslims, how is this gonna land on people when they see Adnan, what he looks like today with his beard and his mother and his advocate, women wearing hijab, how is this gonna land? And that, Sarah Koenig taught me the lesson that when you tell a personal story, people don't care about those things. Um, though I couldn't believe the support we got and the outpouring of love because people were so touched by the plight. And it was such, um, a terrible, I mean, it, it was such like a profound lesson for me because I had spent years in advocacy doing the, Islam is a religion of peace, look at what the scriptures say, you know, and these are the facts and this is the data and nobody cared. So um, I not only, when that happened, I was, um, I started writing all my, my legal briefs differently. I used to write my legal briefs like, you know, I'm attorney for the respondent, respondent respectfully submits, blah, blah, and I'm like, why am I writing like this? Mm -hmm. Like I'm writing like we're all robots here. And I actually started writing my briefs like with people's names and telling their actual stories. And I, I mean, it made such a difference in just the adjudication of those cases. So I think it's so important. That's, that's my answer there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. A whole different scale here. Okay, I have to confess that I don't really know your background and anything about you, so I'm just puzzled by who are these people? Well, uh, you, you mentioned that you have a show, a TV show? No, it's podcast, so it's audio. Podcast. Yeah. So who are these people that, that criticize you about your weight or, or about your skin color? Are they the people that, that well, you, have, you don't have a TV show, so how do they even know what your weight is? And, and, um, and if they're people from Pakistan uh, uh, who are criticizing your, uh, and talk about the skin color being dirt, most of the people that I've met from Pakistan, uh, the they have a color of, uh, uh, like yours or darker than yours. So, yeah. so is there a whole nation of people who are who are against their very own colors? Yes, the answer is yes <laughs> to that question. Um, yeah, and, yeah. I mean, like, so you know, this is a memoir and um, about as I was being raised by my family. You know, the concerns around my weight and my color and the what that would mean for my prospects as I grew up because they were concerned that as I got to you know, 17, 18, 20 years old, which is around the time that South Asian girls will start getting marriage proposals, because that's kind of the system that was in place at that time, that I wouldn't be getting any marriage proposals. And they were right, I wasn't getting any marriage proposals. People would send proposals for my younger sister. And, and they- And she could not indulge those because- her No, you sister can't, that married. would be very improper to try to get the younger sister, like, you know, even engaged before the older sister. So I was like this wall between my sister you know, prospects as well. So my, my, it was my family telling me these things. But here in this country. Yeah. And, and what about these memes and all that? I, I don't know that much about the electronic stuff going on, yeah. but, but uh, how, who are these people and how do they come to criticize you or to say hateful things about you? Are they, they're not the people that read your books, I imagine. I imagine uh, because it's on the internet, a lot of them are anonymous, um, and they're they're. I mean, we call them trolls when they just kind of attack you, and you don't really know who they are. Um, but it's not uncommon. I think almost every public figure has their set of anonymous detractors, and they they want to they want to hurt you. What I what I learned is this: I used to try to respond to those kinds of attacks, and it was preventing me from actually doing my work because I would spend so much time thinking about it and responding to it. And I realized that's actually what they want. They want me to like feel so terrible that I don't continue to speak publicly about these issues or that I don't keep showing up for the media interviews or I don't keep using my voice. And I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna let that happen. So, so your books express your what, a political or social views, is that what? No, it's just a memoir about food, fat, and family. And there are people who get that? that enraged about your opinions about these things that they actually uh, attack you with hate for that? 
it's just a whole world that I, I just don't, I, I didn't know was there. Well, I'm totally puzzled. By it. I would love it if you got a copy of the book outside. They're outside. <laughs> Read it, and um, and uh, you know, you're lucky if you haven't experienced it. That's good. That's good. I'm up for it. Thank you for your comments. All right. I think we have. <laughs> How do you even know what time it is? I just see the door. <laughs> All right. This will be the the final word on this incredible book. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, for this discussion this evening. Marsha did a fantastic job moderating, by the way. Um, and uh, Robbie, I was just wondering, um, most of your past work has um, not been so personal, um, and this obviously was. So I was wondering how that journey of writing this book impacted you mentally and how it, um, it compared or contrasted probably to, you know, to writing most of your advocacy stuff um, that you've done in the past because um, it seems like this was uh, quite a large undertaking for you personally and um, probably made you reflect on a lot of things that you might not have thought about for an extended time and thought about them in new ways. Um, thank you for your question. I, I'll say this, look, you know, I know like a lot of the top, a lot of what we talked about tonight like feels really heavy. But, it, but like you said, you read it in two days. It's not a heavy book, and it's not a it's not a sad story. It, it's actually very funny. I think this yeah. is. I mean, there's there's a great bit of your humor that comes out in it really well. But also, most of these stories fill me with a lot of joy. Even the absolutely crazy ones, like my grandmother stealing food from the Chinese restaurant. I mean, like <laughs> we. I mean, like they are joyous stories to me. And you know, um, I when I wrote the proposal, I said that like. Th this book is in the spirit of my big fat Greek wedding. And if you guys, you know, have seen that movie, you're like, you get a lot of joy from that family. They're crazy. They don't say appropriate things to the protagonist, but you can feel the love. And so for that reason, it wasn't that it was emotionally that difficult for me because there is a lot of, there are, there are parts of that story, obviously, that were not great, but um, lucky, luckily I have a therapist and I've had, ther I've had a therapist for like four years and everybody get a therapist and strength train. Um, those are my t two takeaways, <laughs> um, and that helped a lot. I mean, like, but you know, it was it was has most it was mostly just uh, just a fun a fun thing for me to do. I mean, and I was also really tickled that I won the battle against my editor, and I got to keep my recipes in so people can try them. Um, and there's a lot of layers to the story, and so some people are going to take this as an immigrant story. For others, it's going to be a food memoir. For others, it'll be about the weight. Um, but I do hope one other aspect in here that I tried to embed throughout is like to kind of distinguish and elevate Pakistani culture and cuisine and make people curious about it. And I'm like, go to your local Pakistani restaurant, check it out if you like Indian food. Um, so, you know, I think um, when when you do read it, you're you're not gonna come away feeling like, like, like it took a toll on me to write this. Yeah, but thank you, thank you. And thank you guys all for coming tonight, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. want to thank Rabia and Marsha again this evening. And I want to also thank our wonderful audience, both in person and virtual, for joining us as well. Um, with that, I'm going to open the doors. We will have a signing right outside the auditorium at the Red Table. And if you haven't bought a copy of the book, we would love for you to buy a copy of the book and get it signed. And with that, thank you again, everyone.